Uh, let's broaden our application of signaling a little bit. Let's think about some other ways in which it can apply uh, in the human world. So insurance is a place where you see signaling. Uh, an insurance company provides security against risk. However, when they take you on, when they take your application as an insurance customer, they don't necessarily know how risky they, that you are, right? Which is really important for them to know. If you are very likely to need to get that insurance paid out, then you're going to be a more expensive person to take on. If you're not likely to need to pay out, then you're a less expensive person to take on. If they only take on the expensive people, they're going to pay out more than they take in, they're going to go out of business. So um, what's going to happen? So if you offer a good deal on insurance, who's going to buy your insurance? If you have the same price for everybody, people who are going to buy your insurance are going to be people who know, hey, wait a minute, I see the price. I know that I'm likely to get paid more from them than I'm going to pay to them, right? Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and buy that insurance. So people who expect themselves to need more insurance payout are going to be the ones who are going to buy it. So on average, the insurance company is going to lose money on everybody, and they're going to go out of business. So if this is happening, you means you have to raise your price. You realize, wait a minute, we are spending more money than we're taking in. We got to charge more. And as you raise your price more and more, guess what happens? More people say, oh, well, if I, I'm, I'm on the safest end of this current spectrum, I would, at whatever the price was, let's say it was a hundred bucks a month for, I don't know, fire insurance, right? I live in an area where I, you know, on average, maybe I'll get a payout that's something like a hundred bucks a month. They raised the price to 120 bucks a month because they realized they were only signing up, you know, people who live in Central California or whatever. Uh, and then suddenly, now it's not worth it for me anymore. I'm going to drop my policy, and then it gets more, even more expensive for them to provide insurance on average. So the price needs to go up again and again and again. This was known as a death spiral in insurance. So if you have that price, only riskier people are going to buy your insurance, uh, which is going to make your insurance unprofitable. So you keep keeps going. It's also similar to the Zillow situation where they offered a certain price to homes, but only people who knew that they were being underpriced were going to buy it. Uh, or sorry, being overpriced were going to buy it. Same thing here. Somebody offers you insurance, only people who know that they're going to need more of the insurance than they're going to pay, uh, taking risk into account, are going to buy it. This is called the problem of adverse selection, which is a form of uh, information economics which is related to market problem, the one market limits. And this can, of course, destroy insurance markets. So how do they fix this? Obviously, insurance markets are still around. Um, one way they fix this is by offering the potential customers a signal to send. I mean, one thing is they can just literally ask you information. If you ever sign up for insurance, you know, they ask you everything about your life that they possibly can, right? Uh, you know, if you ever sign up for health insurance, they're like, hey, give me all your health uh, history and give me all of your medications and give me all your height, your weight, your family history. And have you ever walked past somebody who had a cold? Uh, all that sort of stuff. That's one thing, they gather actual information on you. But even then, they can't know everything, right? They don't know everything. You know, they can get all the information on you that they want, uh, but they forgot to ask you, do you eat five pints of ice cream a night? And you do, uh, and that's a health hazard that they are not pricing into their insurance, right? They're always gonna be something really to get. But without gathering all the information, how can they get around this adverse selection problem? Right? Because they make it smaller, but they can't make it go away. But they can offer a signal. So what kind of signal can the insurance company offer? Um, one is deductibles and copays is a way in which these companies can uh, have to allow you to send the signal. So imagine they have two different insurance plans, right? They don't just have one anymore, they got two. One has a higher deductible and copay. The other one has a lower deductible and copay. And then the, the premium that you pay sort of offsets this, right? So what is a deductible and a copay? Uh, a deductible is, you know, every year, let's say you're having health insurance, right? Let's say your deductible is $5,000. Right? So the first $5,000 you spend on health care in a year, the insurance does not pay for. But then after you go over $5,000, then they start paying, right? So if you, you know, if you go to the urgent care and you get a stitch or whatever, uh, they're probably not going to pay for that. But when, you know, you go to the hospital, you spend the night and they charge you $10,000, well, then they're going to step in, right? That's, a, that's what a deductible is. Copay is every time you go to the doctor, they don't cover everything, you just still have to pay a little bit, right? Uh, so, you know, you go to the doctor and they charge you $500 because they did whatever, and the insurance company says, yep, we're covering it, except for your copay, you got to pay 70 bucks. The next time you go to the doctor, pay another 70. So we got deductibles and copays. And we got two different plans that we're offering as an insurance company. We got the high, 
deductible by copay low premium. So it's cheaper insurance to buy, but it's not going to pay us back out as much. Or we can pick plan B, which is low deductible, low copay, and high premium. Right? So this is sort of like Cadillac plan costs a lot, but it pays out a lot. This one is sort of the cheaper one. You don't pay that much, but it doesn't pay you pay back. Then. So why might they offer these two different kinds of insurance? Well, one reason is that it is a way which you can signal your own riskiness level as a patient. Just think about it. Imagine two different people, right? One of them is, one of them knows that they've got a lot of health issues going on. The other one knows that they're pretty healthy. Which insurance plan are they going to choose? Well, if you know that you're going to need your insurance a lot, you're going to want the one that's going to actually pay up. You're going to want this one, right? You're going to be willing to pay that higher premium because you know that you're going to go to the doctor a lot. So please pay me, pay my doctor instead of having me do it. And also, I don't want to have to pay every time I go because I have to go a lot, right? Now, imagine that you're a relatively unrisky person. Which one of these are you going to choose? You're probably going to choose this one because you're probably not going to use the doctor a lot outside of like an emergency, in which case you have the high deductible is fine. I wish I didn't have to pay the first five thousand dollars, but at least I'm not paying two hundred thousand dollars, right? So the less risky person is going to choose this one, and the more risky person is going to choose this one, right? And that's without the insurance company actually knowing which one you are, right? Again, because they can gather as much information as they can with all these questions and stuff like that, but there's still always going to be stuff that they don't know. But they offer you this choice, and you are revealing what you know about yourself by choosing one or the other, which means they can price this one assuming that less risky people are going to choose it, and they can price this one assuming that more risky people are going to choose it. And so you don't get that problem where you're paying out more than you need to take in in either case. So the insurance sort of manages to stay stable. Uh, this was, by the way, this adverse selection problem was sort of with the idea underlying the Affordable Care Act especially the uh, an individual mandate program. So, excuse me, the individual, and the individual mandate requires that people purchase health insurance. Uh, the idea here is that it sort of takes out the adverse selection problem by not allowing the less risky people to walk away. So whatever the price of insurance is, there's gonna be the safest people, or rather the people with the least health risks, who are just not gonna, how would it be worthwhile for them to purchase health insurance, right? No matter how cheap it is, right? Um, and so if that happens, that means that the, uh, the costs are not going to be brought down by that, right? So you bring a really healthy person in to buy health insurance, it lowers the cost on average of providing health insurance because you got a new person in your pool who's basically never going to use it, right? By forcing that person to buy insurance, uh, it sort of spreads the costs around a little. Whether that's a good thing or not depends on whether or not you happen to be that really unrisky when the person who doesn't need health insurance then. But it does ease the adverse selection problem. It allows these insurance markets to stick around uh, in a way and, and avoid that sort of death spiral problem uh, where you suspect that uh, you know, markets might not be, it might be sustainable if they don't have all the people in. And it allows the insurance rates for the risky people to be a little higher. Any questions at this point? Yep. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, 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 because you're, um, well, uh, maybe not this. This wouldn't necessarily be because these are very different products, right? So price discrimination doesn't really apply when you're talking about very different products, right? So you, price discrimination, you want basically or very nearly the same product being different price to different people. What would be price discrimination is... This part, where they ask you a zillion health questions and they charge you differently based on what you answer, right? So charging somebody who with, you know, um, asthma more for their health insurance than somebody without asthma, that's price discrimination. 